hope that it's clear to you where we start. If you remember, <clears throat> what we were discussing was the relationship of plot to theme and the main subject. <laughs> the main subject then was the importance of plot and the dist main distinction between a, a romantic novel or a naturalistic novel, the distinction consisting of the fact that uh, a romantic novel has a plot. A naturalistic novel is usually more or less plot plotless. Now, as you remember our early discussions, that is not the only distinction between the two schools, but that is one of the crucial attributes. A naturalistic novel that would have a good plot structure would be a contradiction, actually. Uh, and we discussed why. Though some naturalistic novels might have a story in the sense of a saga, in the sense of a series of events which will add up to a story, it will not have a plot structure, meaning a purposeful progression of events. Then we discussed the importance of purpose and why, since the romantic school of writing is concerned with values, it is fundamentally the free will school, rather the school which holds philosophically free will as an attribute of man. The naturalistic school essentially is the determinist school in philosophically. It, it holds that man has no free will and is a victim of circumstances or fate or determinism of any kind, but not his own, his own will and choice. Therefore, a naturalistic novel will not be concerned with a plot in the sense of a human purpose, a chosen free will purpose directing the events of a man's life. And we stop on the discussion of the fact that purpose is the crucial element for the construction of a plot. Uh, you remember we discussed the principle of final and efficient causation and why a properly constructed plot has to be built on the principle of uh, efficient, I beg your pardon, of final causation. That is, that the events of the story are basically motivated by the chosen purposes of the main characters. I had stated that purpose presupposes the necessity to achieve it. Therefore, if you are to dramatize, meaning to show in action, a man achieving a purpose, this will mean that you will show a struggle, a chosen purposeful struggle of some kind. If a struggle is involved, it will mean that you will need a conflict. If it's a struggle, then there have to be two opposing forces in conflict. And, therefore, you will have to have a climax, meaning the central point of the story where that conflict is resolved one way or another. Now, we had mentioned very briefly, I think, in answer to the question that a conflict here has to mean conflict with other men or conflict within a man, but not a conflict against nature, chance, or, or coincidence, and that is the point we are now to discuss. Remember that it all pertains to the question of plot structure. Now, why uh, does a well-constructed plot require a human struggle? Because if the nature of the free will philosophy is that man is free to achieve his purposes, then the dramatization of a life of a man on such a philosophy would have to show him choosing and achieving some kind of purpose. But his struggle against nature, for instance, is not actually an issue of free will, or rather, it's free will on his part, but it is not free will on the part of nature. Now, the man can choose to achieve it, and it certainly is a matter of free will, but there is no struggle involved in the sense of a plot, of a story, if a man struggles against blind forces of nature which are deterministic and therefore can do only what they are doing, 
can be only what they are. No suspense, no choice, no conflict can be involved on that part of the adversary, the inanimate part. I believe we touched on it briefly last time, didn't we? Mm -hmm. uh, I know that we discussed it in great length in our preliminary session, so I don't think I have to prove it in too great a detail now. Uh, if it is not fully clear, you can ask me questions later. On that, is this point clear to all of you? Why a conflict against nature is actually not a dramatic conflict? Uh, therefore, if it is, uh, you want a conflict of free will, both adversaries have to have free will. Two choices, two sets of values have to be in involved if your purpose is to dramatize the course of a man's chosen purposeful action. More than that, if it is a dramatization of a man's values, then necessarily two sets of values have to be involved if you are dramatizing a human free will conflict. Now, what do I mean when I say conflict has to be uh, against other men or within the same men? Well, I think that point is clear. Uh, in fact, for the purpose of dramatizing, meaning presenting in action, uh, a man struggle and choice, a conflict within his own mind is one of your best devices. Why? Because it's by means of that that you present clearly and in action the man's freedom, the man's choice, and the fact that it's his decision that resolves the conflict. Now, when I said, or a conflict within a man alone, one could conceivably write a story in which a man is struggling against nothing but himself. Other people will necessarily be involved. But let us say, it will be a conflict between his philosophy and his love, as the, the most uh, primitive form of that kind of conflict, or the most basic. Uh, you could write a story in which the only conflict is within the man and the other characters are passive. You could conceivably build it into a plot structure because the action that he would take on one side of his values or on the other would create a plot structure. But that would be a very difficult assignment and that is not uh, usually the, uh, the proper or the full pattern. The full pattern is, of course, a conflict against other men and uh, a conflict preferably involving a conflict of values within the hero himself. When I say preferably, I mean that kind of element creates the best, more, most complex plot structure. As an example, for instance, if uh, you see Reardon in Evershrug hesitating between quitting his job or continuing the struggle. That is one conflict. That is his conflict against outside forces. And at the same time, inside himself, he has the conflict uh, between his love for Dagny and what he thinks is his duty to his wife. That is an inner conflict, complicating his struggle against the outside world. And as you know, if you remember the story, ultimately, causing him almost to lose against his enemies, against the looters, because of his wrong decision on his personal conflict. Now, that is a very good pattern, if I say so myself, uh, and by my principle, one should, if one can prove it objectively, uh, in what manner one dramatizes uh, a man's conflict uh, and a man's free will. Uh, you integrate it on several different levels and make the same events illustrate both aspects of a conflict. The important thing is here is integration. Now project for a moment this kind of setup. Supposing you took Reardon with the same problems, only uh, his romantic conflict between his wife and, and the woman he really loved had nothing to do 
which is economic country. Neither one was concerned with politics or economics, and one was a private uh, issue, and the other one public. And in events, the two sets of events, the two issues never met. That would be a very badly constructed plot. You can see why. Because then, the inclusion of both in the same story would be purely coincidental. Then it's the story of a man who happens to have two conflicts and he acts on two different issues. Uh, that might be very valid psychologically, but it would not be a good plot story. Uh, when we define plot as a purposeful progression of events, it means that whether you have a very simple one-line story with only one conflict and two or three characters, or a very complex structure like that with shrugged, where you have a number of characters and, and all sorts of different conflicts, in order to have a purposeful progression of events, you have to integrate all those events and make them serve all the kind of conflicts which you are illustrating so that uh, at the end, your climax will resolve all your things. Now, the climax <coughs> is that issue, that, that situation, that event in a story where all the struggles presented in the story reach their resolution, whether the hero wins or is defeated. In either case, it's that event which resolves everything that you have been building up. Naturally, by that mere fact, it has to be near the end, and as to how near depends on the nature of your story. Sometimes it, it might be the very last event uh, of the story. Usually, particularly in a long novel, you will need a few indications of closing events to show the consequences of the resolution of the conflict. Now, I think we discussed that in our preliminary lectures, but I'll repeat it uh, and I'll use the same examples we did because my books are the ones that everybody has read here. Uh, for instance, the climax in With the Living is the scene where uh, Andre discovers that Kerry is Leo's mistress. The search scene and closely allied with it because it's actually one development also, it's two events, the speech of Andre to the party when he denounces the Communist Party and, and rebels openly. Those two are events as one unit, are actually the climax of the story. That which follows is just the conclusion, the result of that event. In the Fountainhead, the climax is, of course, the ex Cortland explosion and the trial. Again, you see, it's one event, in effect. That resolves all the conflicts build up up to then, and then the brief conclusion after the start of the trial is merely showing the events of it. Not the start of the trial. I beg your pardon. Court to court and home. Uh, incidentally, someone once asked me uh, what was an anticlimax. I think it is. I believe that it, uh, originally the term technically in literary courses did mean that which comes after the climax, but today it's used more in the sense of the content, whether, uh, by the standard of whether uh, the events follow from the climax and conclude, in which case it won't be an anti climax. Or, whether a new development in a, an irrelevant issue or an irrelevant problem is set up after the climax, of no relevance to the climax or, in fact, of uh, lesser importance. Uh, that is when I say, uh, you've heard the expression, or oh, don't do this, it would be an anticlimax. It usually means that, for instance, if after the studded, uh, the Cortman trial, I showed, uh, let us say, Wine and Rourke having some kind of quarrel about an unpaid commission on some building. That would be preposterous. Now, that would be 
artifact of anticlimax. Why? Because under the kind of issues that had existed between them and had been resolved, this sort of issue could be of no possible relevance or importance at all, except to destroy the importance of the climax. So that uh, you have to be very careful now, as a technical issue, never to introduce, never to resolve a smaller issue after the climax. Once you have passed the climax, meaning that event which will show who wins and in what manner in the conflict or conflicts involved in your story, do not solve any lesser conflicts or tie any lesser strings afterwards. Uh, therefore, if you have a multiple thread story, it's a complicated story like Atlas Shagd or the Fountainhead, where there are more than just three characters carrying the story, all the problems of the lesser characters, if they are not involved in the climax, have to be solved before the climax. An example of it would be, for instance, in With the Living, uh, the subplot of uh, Irina and Sasha, if you remember, Kira's cousin. Uh, now, it would be terrible anticlimax if I showed the fate of these minor characters and they're being sent to Siberia and their party after I had shown Kira shot on the board. The issue was that would be an improper structure. You cannot resolve a lesser issue after the main one. Or in the fountainhead, let us say the romance of Kitty and Katie. That was a conflict of importance all through the story, and some kind of end had to be reached between them. Now, it would be totally improper to have their last scene written after the end of the book and after Dominic's arrived uh, to roll to the top of the building, then have a second sequence to that last chapter and devote it to Kitting's farewell to Katie. Now you all sense, I, I see by your faces that you sense, in, in fact, in quotes, instinctively, that that would not be right. Now the reason why it wouldn't be right is what we had been discussing, the nature of the climax, the rule in logic that if you present major issues and the climax is their resolution, you cannot uh, present the resolution of minor problems after the major ones. For a well-integrated plot, minor issues, lesser characters or subplots anyway have to be integrated to the main events. They should not be a totally separate track. And after you have resolved the main events and the main climax, it is too late to attend to the lesser ones. However, uh, it is very important that every issue that you raise in a story, every form of conflict, if it's included at all, it is very important that it be resolved. Uh, one of the things about badly constructed novels, you undoubtedly have seen, which is extremely irritating and annoying in reading, is that the author might pose minor problems, then solve a few of his major ones and leave the minor ones uh, hanging in the air, almost as if he had started writing and then forgot all about it and n never got to solving it. Uh, needless to say, in bad novels, even the major issues are not resolved. But there are many novels that have certain value and certain proper plot structure in the main, but are guilty of that kind of carelessness. The rule here is that Anything which you mention, if it is in the nature of an issue or a conflict, has to be resolved one way or another before your story ends. And in this respect, Chekhov had a very good rule, which uh, he applied to plays, but it applies to novels just as well. Uh, his statement was, never hang a gun in the first act if you don't intend to have a go off in the third. Uh, that applies to everything in the structure of a plot. What we call a red herring is precisely the, the breach of that rule, hanging up a gun or promising your gun somewhere, which never goes off, or an issue that is never resolved. Now, I don't have to uh, tell you much about why 
coincidence is a very bad element in Russia. And disasters in plus Russia. Uh, only the lesser type of plot writers, usually the not so good detective stories or uh, mystery stories would employ coincidence. So, so unfortunately some very great plot writers like Hugo are guilty of it at times. But that is something to be avoided at all costs for very obvious reasons. Uh, since the justification for having a plot at all, the philosophical reason and the nature of the appeal of a plot, whether a reader uh, identifies it consciously or not, which is still so in fact, since the nature is the presentation of free will and of a man's achievement or of his purpose or at least struggle for his purpose, the introduction of coincidence <laughs> is totally irrelevant and would be more jarring in a plot story than in a plotless one. It's bad anywhere, but it's particularly bad in a plotless story. Because coincidence is totally irrelevant to anyone's choice or purpose. It can happen. Coincidences do happen in life. But the point is that it is meaningless. There's no significance to it of any kind. Yes? Did you mean that it was worse in a plot story or plotless? Worse in a plot story. Oh, you said plotless. I didn't. Sure. I beg your pardon. No, I said also <laughs> it's bad even in a plotless story. Coincidence is always unconvincing. In a plot story, it is much worse, uh, because it destroys the skeleton, the base, the principle on which your whole story is constructed, namely the creation of a purposeful series of events. If they are purposeful, meaning if they deal with a certain issue and are involved with a character, free will, action, his struggle, his choice of values, the introduction of a coincidence, is senseless. Uh, and, and in that uh, regard, don't ever write the kind of stories that I've, ma I've mentioned this before, in which a conflict is suddenly resolved by some natural disaster, such as a flood or an earthquake uh, or a fire that suddenly brings everybody together or kills the villain conveniently at the right moment. You know, you've seen that particular in movies. It's, it's clear why this is bad. Now, very closely allied with the issue of plot as an attribute, it is the question of suspense. And some of you have asked me, uh, what is the secret of achieving suspense in a story? If you identify to yourself what held your interest in any story which you read, if you felt that you can't put it down, or in the theater, if you sit on the edge of your seat. Now that would be the emotional reaction to the fact that the story has suspense. Ask yourself, what is it that held you? Now if you try to recall any story or play that held you in this manner, you will find that it is invariably and necessarily a story in which the author lets you in on his purpose. By that I don't mean his theme or his philosophy. I don't mean that it can't be a mystery story. I mean this, that the author had to give you reason to be interested and to construct his events in such a manner that you would have reason to be interested and to wonder about the outcome. If the author tells you, in effect, what is going to happen, the story is not going to hold your interest. Or, if he doesn't tell you what's going to happen, but you don't know where the story is going at all, you don't know what to expect. If it is an arbitrary jumble of events thrown together by coincidence or by the author's will. Or sometimes, even, it might have an inner logic to it, which you later discover, except that the author never showed you why the events follow in this manner and what to expect, you will not be interested. Uh, let me give you restations. Uh, for instance, now take out the shadow. Did it interest you in the reading of the story uh, what would happen 
uh, it really discovered that Francisco had been dead in Sweetheart. Now that point did hold your interest, uh, didn't it? Uh, at the moment when, you know, in the chapter before last, uh, part two, when Reardon enters Dagny's apartment and there is Francisco. Now that scene, I believe, should, in fact, must hold any reader. The one who is not held by it is simply not a rational reader and, and expects something other than rational consideration. Because that's an archetype of a suspense scene. Now analyze why. Because for a long time past, you have been given ground to wonder what will Dagny do when either or both of, of the two men discover their relationship to her. What will Reardon do? What will Francisco do? I had let you in on what to expect. Uh, I had planted uh, that Reardon was extremely anxious to find out the name of the man in her past and that Francisco was in love with her and for some reason which is not revealed at that time but could be guessed by then. He is waiting for something before he can tell her the full truth about himself, but then he's still hoping that she has waited for him. That has been planted several times. Therefore, you know that when those three find out the full truth of the situation, some very drastic fireworks are going to happen, or to put it more seriously, some very strong reactions, which in advance you have reason to guess about, but could not predict for certain. It is not obvious how those people would react or what would be the result. That is what would make you watch it with interest or wait for it. But let us suppose that he didn't know everything about Agnes past. He knows that she had once been in love with Francisco and, and then left him or he left her. Uh, and by the time that... Uh, he falls in love with Dagny. By the time of their affair, uh, Francisco already has had reason to suspect that uh, this is the man, Reardon is the man whom Dagny is going to fall for. And the very next day, after the beginning of the Dagny Reardon romance, Francisco comes to visit her and everybody learns the truth. Uh, would that have any kind of suspense value at all? Would it be interesting? Not particularly. Even if the characters are interesting, you have had no reason to attach any importance to them learning the truth. In fact, they, uh, two of them knew it, and the only one that might have to uh, learn the surprise might be Francisco's, but he expected it. Therefore, there's no particular conflict, nor drama involved, nor anything to wonder about. If you want to hold your readers, give them something to wonder about. I know one Hollywood uh, scenario writer, a woman, who incidentally had a very good plot sense, who had an expression of her own for this problem. She said when she starts on a story, she always has to establish a worry line. And you see why that's very graphic. Uh, a line of suspense, a line of problems or issues for the reader or the audience to worry about. Now, to do that, you naturally not only have to know how to build up your suspense, how to feed uh, the reader information step by step, uh, but also to set up the kind of wonder or conflict or issue which has reason to interest the reader. Uh, because let us suppose uh, the conflict was this. Dagny considered dyeing her hair blonde and wondered how James will take it. Now, if there were the kind of characters who could be uh, worried about an issue like that, you would have no reason to be interested in the characters, nor would you be interested in the issue. In other words, when you set up a line of suspense, or a line of a progressing conflict, you have to ask yourself, is there any rational reason why anyone should be interested in this kind of conflict? 
is there a value in this conflict? What kind of value? In rational terms, can you, the author, name why this value is in this issue or value is important enough for anyone to worry about or to be interested in the outcome? Now, I wanted to give you some illustrations of the importance of plot and of its relationship to the interest, the suspense of a story, and to its theme. Now, I will be repeating the examples that we used in our preliminary session. So those of you who have heard, bear with it, because, again, I'll, I have to take my own books, since at least the one common denominator that I know you've all read. Uh, try to project with me, I'm going to name them. Some of the issues in the Fountainhead, for instance, or in Atlas Shrugged. If I had presented the same issues without a plot and without a suspense line. For instance, uh, I'll take the Dagny Reardon romance uh, in Atlas Shrugged. What is the meaning uh, that is what is the kind of relationship? that have to be presented. Well, the fact of Reardon and Dagny having great deal in common, philosophically, sharing the same struggle, the same ideas, which, therefore, the same values, which would make them fall in love eventually. That's the material of the story. Now, here's what a plotless writer would have done with it. One day, Dagny comes to Reardon's office and uh, they start talking, and then irresistibly and suddenly he draws her into his arms, and they kiss. And they confess that they're in love with each other. Well, that's fine in the realistic sense. It can happen that way. Is there much dramatic value in it? As far as the event is concerned, the same sort of thing could have happened between James Taggart and Bessie Pope or anyone else. I mean, the event was merely two people in a room. Uh, they met for some irrelevant purpose, only since they had been uh, sharing values or interests together, they had fallen in love, and in that scene they finally admitted. But now what did I do with Atlas? I made them admit their love, that is, bring them to a love scene, in an event which presented in action that which they had in common. If my point is that here are a man and a woman who share the same ideas, the same values, and the same struggle, and that is the bond between them, that is the root of their love and, in fact, of any proper love, then when do I bring about the love scene? At the height of the mutual triumph in connection with the particular achievement with which united their two careers, the construction of the John Gold Line. This is, that is an example of presenting an issue in plot terms, in dramatized terms, meaning in action. Now take, for instance, the scene where Reardon quits. That is chapter 6 of part 3. From the beginning of the story, you knew that he was going to quit someday. Or rather, you knew it from the time you begin to see why the men are quitting. Either sooner or later, the you would have to be the one to go. Now again, if a plotless writer even dealt with a theme of this kind, but just assume that my plot invention failed at this time, or I began to be sloppy and decided to take the easiest way out, what would I, how would I take Reardon out of the story? I mean, what would I do? at the point when I have to have him quit. Well, he would be sitting in his, at his desk or maybe walking down the country road and thinking over the situation. He would decide, yes, I guess things are pretty bad. I can't stand it any longer. I guess I'll quit. Mm -hmm. But now this is that's realistic. In fact, then, uh, some critics might say I'm a good naturalistic writer. Only to be allowed this story. Mm -hmm. Why? Even though this sort of decision is impossible, uh, and in perhaps in real life it would be perfectly proper, a man has to reach uh, a certain conclusion, he has to think it over. Only 
then the decision would be happening inside the man's head. It would be a purely psychological development. There would be nothing in action except he's sitting at a desk or walking down the, uh, the street uh, to show the nature of it and the elements of his decision. As a plot writer, here is the logic of what I had to do. Since the nature of a man going on strike has, throughout the whole story, been composed of two elements. One, the victim's progressive understanding of the fact that he's a victim and should stop being a victim. The other, uh, the fact that he's convinced that under the present setup, he cannot continue. Now he has to reach the point of when he said enough. Remember when Francesco Warren's died in incident with this in the side, in case anyone missed that line at the end of chapter five uh, of part one, where Francesco said, uh, you have a great deal of courage, someday you'll have enough of it. He did not mean enough courage. He meant you'll have enough of the setup with the Luthers. Uh, and then you remember later I pointed out uh, that uh, the destroyer always seems to know when a man has had enough. He knows when Alice White is ready, he knows when Ken Danager is ready, etc. Uh, therefore, those were the two elements that had to be present when I take out of the story the main character, the, uh, the man who in effect, symbolizes what the strike is all about. The man whom uh, Gold calls the greatest victim I have avenged. Because the story of Hank Reardon, in essence, <coughs> is the story of all the strikers. Uh, except that his is presented in greatest detail. Now I had to have two things happen. His realization of the nature of the whole issue and why he should quit. And the final atrocity, the, the final act of the looters, which would make him decide now he's had enough and the situation is hopeless. If nothing in particular had happened uh, after, let's say, Directive 10 to 89, which was the last preceding atrocity, if that had been the last action on the part of the looters, and then by chapter 6 of part 3, Jürgen has decided things are going so badly, he now sees that he can't take it, that would not be dramatizing the issue. Therefore, I had to have an event which would be a result of the Directive 10 to 89, but it had to be an action event directed against Reardon, which would bring to a head, incidentally, in the reader's eyes, and certainly in Reardon's eyes, Bring their head the fact that he cannot function under the system and that this is the last outrage, the climax of everything that the Luthers have done against him. That is why I had to have a special event of the Luthers directed against him. And during this event, he would then have to realize the last missing links in his philosophical development. He would have to understand the whole case. And if, if you remember the story, that is exactly what happened. I had shown enough of Reardon's progressive philosophical education, that is, that he gradually was understanding the issue of what is later called speech. He was understanding the whole case for the strike, step by step, in connection with different events in his life and his relationship with Dagny. If you remember that whole philosophical transition of his was dramatized, illustrates an event. Certain things were still missing, and it's only in chapter 6, uh, in that issue of demands to work at a loss, to operate uh, being paid less than, than he still cost him, in order to support his worst enemies in paradise, it's in that Plus, the whole fraud of the government's uh, engineered assault on his meals, that is what was necessary to dramatize 
the whole issue of the strike and specifically the issue in Reddy's life. It, uh, that is why the way he went out on strike was dramatic. The way I mentioned it would have been done by a naturalist. Was not. Take the case of Dagny. She is the last of the strikers. Now, by the time that she is ready to quit, if you remember, there was just one issue which psychologically would have been sufficient, uh, namely when she saw the attitude uh, of James Taggart and his whole side towards John Gold at that banquet. She saw, in fact, uh, what is the nature of the enemy. She saw the truth about the last premise which she had to learn, namely the death premise. If you remember, that was the issue which she could not understand. That's the issue which still held her to the world. Because so long as she didn't understand the death premise in people, she would in reason think that she had a chance. So, so long as they want to leave, and she is acting on the premise of life sooner or later, they will recognize that she's right. It's only when she convinced herself of what is the nature of death premise that she was ready to quit. Now that part of it was presented in action. And then know that it was convincing to you that after the banquet, when she knows that they're going to torture God, she's ready to leave this world. There's nothing there for her any, anymore. But the uh, one that you realize in this context of plot structure, why, if this is all that had happened, that would have been a somewhat unsatisfactory way of making her go on strike. It would be all right, but something would be missing. And I think you would sense it rather than grasp it consciously. Namely, it, her attitude toward that which had represented her whole tie to the world, her railroad, would not be directly involved. But if at the last, all she was concerned with is the world that she told called, and the meaning of it, and then she saw that they're going to torture him, and she decided, well, that's it. I've had enough. I'm going to quit now. What would have been totally forgotten, at least in terms of events, is the fact that her main concern in the world, that which held her against God, made her leave the valley, was her railroad. Therefore, for proper dramatic structure, for proper dramatization of Dagny going on strike, her railroad had to be involved in some one last issue. That was the right moment, therefore, to have the issue of the collapsing bridge come up. That was the purpose of setting it up at this point. Since she had once before attempted to quit, and her railroad won over her moral indignation, in effect, or over her self-interest almost, because she was willing to fight a hopeless battle when she returned back to her job after the tunnel catastrophe. This time, when her railroad is in a much more crucial and final emergency, she had to show you, the reader, in action, for the purpose of a proper dramatization, she had to be placed in terms of action in a moment where she would have to choose between the strike and her railroad. And that was the purpose of her leaping to that telephone, if you remember, the last moment of hesitation. And then, of course, the strike moves, and, and she says she doesn't know what's to be done. Uh, if that moment appealed to you emotionally or if reading it, you felt that this is dramatic. What I'm telling you now is the mechanics, the wires behind the scene which make it dramatic. The reason it appealed to you is precisely because there was this, logically, the satisfaction of her last decision uniting all the issues of her life and all the conflicts. Not merely in her mind, not merely in her thinking about the railroad, but in action, something has happened, an event has taken place, and she had to make a decision about it.
uh, if that moment appealed to you emotionally or if reading it, you felt that this is dramatic, what I'm telling you now is the mechanics, the wires behind the scene which make it dramatic. The reason it appealed to you is precisely because there was this logically the satisfaction of her last decision uniting all the issues of her life and all the conflict. Not merely in her mind, not merely in her thinking about the railroad, but in action. Something has happened, an event has taken place, and she had to make a decision about it. Uh, now, is this point clear as to, or should I give you more examples uh, of what would happen to issues or materials in the story if treated plotlessly? I think that's clear to everybody, isn't it? Uh, if you try to think uh, just as a literary exercise, I would advise you try to, to think of any other issues in my books or in any other books you've read uh, that are of the Romantic school, namely plot structure books. Name to yourself the meaning of the kind of event that is being presented and then try to project mentally what would happen if it was presented but without action. If any conflict or issue was resolved merely in someone's emotions or mind. Whereas the physical outward events would be only someone sitting in a room or standing in the window or walking down the street. That is the naturalistic school of writing in effect, in principle. That is the plotless way of writing. For a plot structure, you have to have your main issues dramatized in action. At this point, one of the students asked Miss Rand to give an analysis of Dominique's first meeting with Howard Rourke, what uh, the meaning of that meeting was and what was its stress. Uh, all right. Well, that's a rather simple, really. Uh, in this sense, it's one line, probably. but still, it's a conflict. <coughs> well, now, let us say that uh, the event or the issue to present there is the manner in which Dominique will fall in love. And we know, by what we know about her so far, that she's an extreme hero worshiper. She declared she'll never fall in love except uh, with something great, and she doesn't want to find a great man because she thinks that he would be doomed. Now, it's very conceivable, as I said, writing the same story, I would have her meet Rourke as an architect. Supposing in the course of one of her writing her columns about buildings, she comes on the site of the Enright building. That I suppose I don't introduce her uh, to Rourke earlier. She meets him only after he's already arriving, and she meets him on the site of the Enright house. Would that be very much dramatized? No. Uh, why was there drama in having her meet her ideal man in the worst role possible as, as a practically unskilled laborer or barely above it? Uh, precisely because if her fear was that the hero would not be able to hold out against the world, the world would always destroy him. That is what had, what wrecked all of her life until she corrected her premises. Uh, seeing her hero at the worst position possible, seeing him at the bottom, in effect underscoring her view of the malevolent universe, uh, was the dramatic presentation of it, because there she would be in a conflict, in fact, between her view of her own values, her realization that this is the ideal man regardless of what the world has done, she doesn't even know his profession. All she sees is a man of great character. <coughs> and she also sees that he's obviously above the position of a quarry worker. And all her stressed insults to him are, in effect, a statement of the opposite. If she really thought that he was nothing but a quarry worker who accepted tips for his work, she wouldn't have done that. Her doing it was a deliberate stressing of the opposite, in effect, of an attempt to deny to herself that she knows the opposite. Therefore, finding her hero in these circumstances would bring her face-to-face -face with the conflict of no matter what 
the world does or what his circumstances, the kind of man she has in mind is a value and will always remain a value. And she can't resist that value. She can't resist her own feeling for him under the worst circumstances possible. That would have been a, that is the meaning, the dramatic, the, or rather, the, the purpose which this type of meeting serves to demonstrate. Is this uh, what you want? Uh, if anyone has any other question about any particular thing that you like or anything that may not, where the connection may not be too obvious, uh, ask me now if you wish. If not later, of course. But I think the pattern here is clear. Isn't it? On the importance of plot. I and mean, in what manner, if you want a plot story, after you are clear on what kind of issues you want to present. Your job then is to think of the kind of events which will present these issues in action. Now, as an example of, of out of some of different medium, an example of the proper dramatization of a romantic plot story, but the simplest kind of example, like a miniature, have any of you seen a couple of months ago a half-hour drama on television called The Kid at the Stick? Nobody here has seen it? it was on a Sunday. Oh, that's a shame, because it's probably the best thing I have seen on television. I can tell you the story in two words, and you'll see the possibilities and why it made such a good story. The time I saw it, I regretted that uh, I, if I had known in advance, I would have asked the class to look at it. Uh, the story is this. It's a young kid of 11 years old who is flying. Uh, no, I'm taking it. Excuse me. I'm guilty of bad plot structure. I'm uh, telling it from the wrong end. The story actually starts at some landing field uh, in Kansas or Colorado or some such place where uh, they get a call from an airplane and it's a child's voice. Uh, speaking over the radio, and an 11 year old boy, and they learned that he was flying with his father. The father is a private pilot, and he has a small private plane. And the father suddenly got violently ill, and just before he passed out, he uh, showed the kid how to operate the radio. And that is all the kid knows how to do. And the father fainted. He is not dead, but he's obviously very ill and unconscious. And the kid is calling the, the nearest airfield to ask what he is to do. And the second time he's ever been up in the air, he knows nothing about flying a plane. And the man at the airport attempts to make him land the plane by talking to him, giving him lessons. He has about two hours before he reaches this field and he has enough gas for it. And he's teaching him how to operate the machine, where, which lever is how to turn, how to bank, and then how to lower, how to watch his wings. And it's the most exciting thing I have seen on, on TV, just project for a moment the possibilities of it. And uh, whoever wrote it was a good writer because he knew exactly how to milk the material. It isn't only the suspense of will the kid learn it, but the author very skillfully showed the emotional meaning of this procedure to both. That is, the child desperately trying to do it and then giving up once in a while. He'll scream, Mr. Stone, so I don't know what to do. Help me, I can't do it. I won't be able to do it. And the man at the landing field having to stop the boy's morale, himself being terrified. You see him shaking behind the scenes and he's trying very calmly to say, oh, yes, you can do it. And one time when the boy breaks down, he begins to bowl him out and uh, tell him you're a coward or uh, the insulting things deliberately to bring him out of it. The psychology of both was so beautifully presented at just the right dramatic moments. Uh, plus, then there's a lot of issues as a side issue on the ground in the, uh, at the landing field. The head manager or owner, whoever he was, is objecting very strongly and telling uh, the man who is uh, on the air to let it go and just forget about it. It's not their responsibility because the kid is sure 
to be killed and, and they will be held responsible, so don't try it. And he fires the man at the last moment for insisting. And the man says, all right, he's fired, but he will continue. Because the plane is just approaching, coming in sight now. And they all know that it's one chance in a thousand. In fact, I'm not sure that realistically it's even possible. And of course, the kid does land. Pardon? But that nature of the climax when he runs out of gas at the last moment, and you're not, and you're not quite sure what happened. Oh, that's right. Uh, he must have had enough. Just, Just barely. The issue is they found out earlier that he had failed to get refueled at a buy station because they had landed there too early. And that uh, subsequently oh, yeah. figured out that he's got just about enough to make it probably not enough. And that just about... Uh, That's the e extra element. You don't know whether he'll even have enough gas to last. And then the, the engine comes out uh, 100 yards from the landing strip or just over it. And that, uh, but by that time he can... Yeah, but the issue being that uh, it's as though everything is going along just right. And then all of a sudden the last event, the thing which has been underlying the whole plot, namely will he have enough gas, erupts at the critical, crucial moment. And I think that is what gave a double of... Oh, that was just extra. Yeah, yes. Really pretty well done, oh, very, very well done. I mean, as a, as a good side touch, fed at the right moment. That wasn't underlying the whole plot, because you remember it came up somewhere middle of the story. First, they thought that uh, he had enough gas, and checking at the air uh, landing fields where the plane had stopped, they found that the father had not refueled. Uh, even though that was the extra yes, shock the just plot, before but... his. Uh, going to attempt to land, which is, of course, the hardest thing, the hardest part of the job. Uh, it was an excellently written script. Now, uh, as I said, the, the boy did make it and everything, and certainly the father is taken to the hospital. Incidentally, he has acute appendicitis, so you learn that he'll be all right. Now, why do I say that this particular story is the archetype, kind of very simple half-hour example of what is a good romantic plot story? Because, observe, you could not select a simpler <laughs> and more horrifyingly dramatic issue of free will. The whole struggle there was the struggle of the human mind, two minds. <clears throat> One, the mind of the man on the ground trying to impart knowledge to a child in order to fight a terrible catastrophe. And the other, the struggle of the child between the knowledge within his rational faculty his decision and desperate emotional fear, which he had good reason to feel. In other words, the conflict in both the teacher and the pupil was between two very strong values rationally justified in this situation. Both the man and the boy had reason to be afraid. And what was the free will element, the moral element in both of them? The triumph of the mind of knowledge, of decision, of purpose over the legitimate fear. Neither of them surrendered to the impossible circumstances and just said what's the use. They both fought it out to the end. So that the story, as far as events are concerned, is a very simple one, slightly improbable, which is what makes it interesting, but it's simple in the sense it's only the story of a landing. But when you consider the element involved, and that this was the archetype of the non-Shakespearean, non-Tolstoy, non-naturalistic setup. That is what makes it such a small little classic uh, of the essence of a romantic story. Yes? Uh, uh, in the this television play, very well done, incidentally. That's a good question. It was this, uh, since the plane uh, lands some distance away from the main building from which man was broadcasting, uh, the moment they see the, the plane approaching, they, of course, have ambulances, radios, and car radio, and everybody rushes to the place where the boy has landed, except the hero, the man who was broadcasting. So that you first see them uh, the general suspense and, and, and relief and uh, incredulity, the boy has made it. Uh, someone yells that and then they all rush. And you see the boy descending, you see the ambulance, 
and the doctor announcing what the matter with the father so that that issue is resolved, you don't see the meeting of the two as yet, till the last event. And after the kid is already on the ground and they told him his father would be all right, and someone points out to him, there's the man who talked to you in the flying. And you see the talker descending from a car, and the boy runs towards him and literally leaps into his arms. It was, they were not afraid of sentiment, for which again I give them a great plot. You know to what extent modern stories are ended inconclusively or just before the big moment. Here it was an old-fashioned embrace in the best, uh, sense of the word, that the little boy runs and just kind of leaps in the air and the older man uh, holds him and just hugs him to, uh, and both of them laugh very happily and uh, uh, the boy yells Mr. Stone, so whichever his name is and she says Frankie, and that was the boy's name she, uh, and they, they were addressing each other by names throughout the whole story over the radio and that's all that they say to each other. That's the end. Yes? Do you think you can think of a better ending than that? Not possibly. Can you? And you see why I say this is good? Because the major issue, that which would interest us, the climax, of course, is when the boy lands. Now, what uh, consequence of the climax would interest us most? Necessarily the relation of the boy to the instructor. Not even the fate of the father, nor... Uh, the concern of the manager of the airfield, uh, none of the smaller issues are as important as the meeting of those two after the kind of struggle that both have gone through. Therefore, after that embrace, in celebration, there's nothing more to add and nothing more to tell you. Now, is this clear? As an example, I mean, you clear why? Uh, I chose this particular one. Now, that is a one-line story. In effect, that would be the pattern for a short story. For the benefit of those who uh, were not at our preliminary meetings, I had once defined a short story as a, a one-incident story, <coughs> a story in which there is only one incident being followed to a certain resolution. Now, this uh, was a one-act play which is, in effect, in structure, is the same principle as a short story. One incident, but an incident that has a beginning and a solution. Now, a novel is merely the complication of the same pattern. A novel has to have much more than one incident. It has to have a string of incidents, a string of events, built up to a longer range or wider issues than this. But the principles applying to the structure of this kind of story are in essence the principles that you have to have in mind in writing the most complex thousand issues involved uh, novel possible. There it will be the same kind of rules, the same kind of principles, the same integration to keep in mind. Only there will be more of it and therefore you have to do a great deal more thinking, more careful structure. But the total of a novel and every part of it, every separate issue would have to be handled by exactly the same kind of principle. Now, is it clear to you why this particular story would never be written by a naturalist? Not only is it not the kind of thing that is very likely to happen, but it's certainly not a statistical average. I mean, it is not that kind of issue that would numerically, by statistics, be an, an average or normal event in anyone's life. More than that, if men are determined, whether by their, their background, fate or glands or whatever, this is not the kind of story that could possibly occur to a man on that philosophy, nor, nor the kind of story that the determinist would want to write. Because there would be no suspense in whatever if we assume that both of them are robots who had to do what they did, and that if fate decreed that they succeed, then the boy will land. If fate decreed that he uh, dies, then he dies. Now you would say, on a deterministic premise, this little story would be perfectly senseless, 
and there would be no suspense in the talk. Now, would there, would there be any kind of value in it if you actually believe and keep in mind watching it that the two characters have no choice about it at all? That some fate or God or the glands in both of them or social conditioning or whichever has at this moment already determined the outcome of this trouble. And whether the boy lands or dies, it's all set long ago. On that premise, you would not finish looking at the story. You'd be bored. But now I want you to realize this, that the same principle applies to all the most complex works of the naturalistic school. By the very same token, why this story would be robbed of all its meaning, and I observed that you were listening to me with great interest, the, the, the story does have a tremendous appeal, even in synopsis form. Uh, by the same token, for the same reason why that kind of very charming, very intelligent story would have no meaning at all if you assume that the characters were determined, it for the same reason projected on a wider scale and imagine war and peace or any Shakespearean drama, which you're reading and taking the word author at his word. That is, remembering that no matter what you see happening, it's all set in advance and the puppets have no choice about it. I have mentioned this to once more underscore the contradiction in a naturalistic school. Uh, when a naturalist writes a novel, he in effect is guilty of the fallacy of the stolen concept. He is using the kind of assumption in the reader's mind which comes from the free will premise. On the deterministic premise, there would be no literature, at least certainly not stories or novels, because even sagas are still listened to or interest anyone on the assumption that the man had some kind of choice in it and some kind of choice uh, of learning something or deriving some value from the history of another man. If you are thoroughly on the determinist premise, there could be no possible in this mini story, nor would you want to write one, nor in fact would any action be possible there. Now, what you have to keep in mind here, as, and again, an issue between the two schools, which is pertinent to the particular aspect of plot, is that the romantic school deals with fundamentals. The naturalistic school deals with details, never touches basic premises, and never answers basic why. Now, let me elaborate this. In all the illustrations that I have given you of how to dramatize an issue, in all the illustrations of why any incident which happens only in the mind of the leader, or of the hero, but is never presented in, uh, in action, observe this, that the mental process which the writer had to perform in order to put his material into a dramatic form was the process of finding what is essential here and building an event around that. Coming back to our illustrations, if Reardon decides to quit while he is sitting at his desk and just, just thinking it over, the fact that he is sitting at his desk is totally irrelevant to the issue going on in his mind and being resolved. Now, supposing he's walking down the street, that also is irrelevant. Supposing he's driving an automobile and has a traffic accident. And now, you'd say that's physical action, isn't it? Yes, it is. Except that what he's thinking about is should he quit or not? And the traffic accident has no bearing one way or another on what he's thinking, except that maybe he has to... Uh, interrupt his thinking long enough to get out of the car and see whether he's certain, then call a taxi uh, or call a garage for his car and continue his thinking. Now you'll say he is involved in some kind of action while he's making his decision. Yes, he is, only the action is totally irrelevant to the issue that is going on in his mind. Therefore, when you decide how am I going to dramatize 
that, which is the meaning of this particular development in my story, you have to ask yourself what is essential. If what Reardon's conflict is, his rebellion against the Luthers and his decision to quit, then that mental process in his mind has to accompany events which have to do with that. And you have to be very clear on what is essential to the conflict I'm dramatizing. Or let us suppose this. Let us suppose it felt as preposterous as an uh, automobile accident. But it's something like this. Nothing happened on the day when he had quit, except that Wesley Mouch telephoned him from Washington and was very rude to him. Over nothing in particular, uh, maybe this is a, the last straw was somebody's bad manners. That the last event uh, over which he decided to quit was just Mauch's rudeness. You see, that has something to do with the issue, but it's not essential to the issue. So what you always have to do is dramatize that which is essential. In order to be able to do that without too great a superstructure struggle, you have to train your mind, train your method of thinking, not on issues of literature only, but on all issues. Train your mind to think in terms of essentials and to know what is essential in any given issue or moment or book you're reading or in your own life. If you see that it is important for a good plot story, Believe me, and I think you know enough by now to understand it, it is a million times more important for your own life. You don't, you yourself do not want a life which is a plotless story, nor a badly constructed story. You don't want a life which is a series of unrelated episodes with no progression, no purpose, and no climax. And if you ask, I'm deliberately not giving you this advice on two fronts. If you ask, but how does one have a good plot structure or life structure? By only one method, and that is knowing essentials. Recognizing what is the essence of, what is the important thing in any issue that you deal with. That applies to one's own life, and that applies to well-constructed novel. But now observe what a naturalist does. That's the whole nature of a naturalist, that he treats of details. We had mentioned that before. You'll see it progressively clearer when we come to characterization style. A naturalist never deals with basic essences. In what sense? He never questions human motivation. He will tell you, Men act in this kind of way. He will not tell you why they do it. Or if he does indicate a few why, a serious writer will, there will always be comparatively very superficial. And they will always stop short of any fundamental why. By a fundamental why, I mean an issue pertaining to all human beings a universal of human psychology, anything that is of importance to all men. Uh, a naturalist will always deal with a certain type of man in a certain given setup. Now, for instance, take again war and peace. A certain kind of characters, the whole arena of them, a whole country, is shown uh, in the period of a historical upheaval, the period of a war. And the author shows fairly well, uh, as far as uh, photography is concerned, how the peasants react or how the aristocrats react, and among those, what type of man reacts how, or what events do to him. Why he reacts that way? Why do certain events strike him that way is never answered nor touched upon. And can be, because the author's whole premise is that men do not make events. Men are determined to be what they are. Therefore, if it, uh, one aristocrat turns out to be idealistic and dies nobly, and somebody else turns out to be a coward, well, that's the way fate decreed that they had to be. And that all that he can show you 
is the logic of uh, the connections between this man's events, granting this kind of man. But why he is this kind of man? And what is the meaning of the kind of fate that strikes him? Blank out. That is never answered because it is outside the premise from which a naturalist right. Now, take for instance a modern naturalist, take by love possessed, which as I said, I have not read, but I had a very expert synopsis given to me, and I've read just chosen passages only to get an idea of the nature of the thing. Now, there's a most preposterous idea in it. In fact, the idea is that reason is helpless. And uh, the author presents a certain character who the hero is allegedly a man of reason. The fact of being a man of reason consists of never, never giving in to your emotions and feeling nothing and being kind of cautious middle of the road, which means to be sensible. And uh, if he gives in to his emotions occasionally, that is, of course, disaster, and that's his uh, imperfection, in effect. Everybody in the story goes through all kinds of disasters. Now, what is it the author never answers? What is the meaning of emotions? What is the meaning of reason? Why did those characters take things the way they took them? Did they really have to? No. That would not be touched upon, because the author's first premise is, here are characters as they exist, as I have observed them, and granted these types, this is what I think will be logical for them to do. And it has a certain kind of logic on that kind of premise, except that the disasters are slightly overdone. But the question of defining the human elements with which the author is concerned, as any author is concerned, such as what are emotions? What is the mind? And if all these men are the product of their background, who made the background? Why did they turn out that way? No answer to any of it. A naturalist cannot deal with fundamentals. I think we can stop at this point now and uh, start for the broadcast, except one more, uh, one slight point to be made in this connection, more philosophical than literary. Observe that a naturalist, like any determinist, uh, is in this kind of predicament. He thinks, but his basic premise is that A is A, not in relation to nature, but in relation to the man-made. Whichever man has made, it is what it is, and nothing on earth can change it. Therefore, of course, nature can, uh, cannot be changed either. But observe that a naturalist takes human character for granted, as if it were a fact of nature. And necessarily, when you take man, the, uh, more, the man-made as unalterable, then nature becomes the free element in this sense. Then you cannot deal with nature. More than that, if you say a man has no choice about how he looks at nature. He has no choice. He is determined. And whatever he does is what it is. And no questions to be asked about it. It's a, it there's no causes because it's the first cause, in effect. Its causes are beyond our power. Men are what they are in their actions and the events, that which they do, is what it is. And nothing we can do about it. And of course, the free rather, in effect, the mystical will be nature, then man is helpless against nature. And if you, the more you read a naturalistic novel, the more you will see that implication. The, the implication in the story and overall in the mind of the author to take the man-made as the absolute and unchangeable and therefore to be helpless before the total spectacle. If you can't ask basic causes, you can't change the consequence. You can't do anything, neither about man, nor his life on earth, nor in effect nature. And we'll stop at this point.